Brazil's President Jair Bolsonaro and former Justice Minister Sergio Moro could be linked to the murder of councilwoman and social activist Mariela Franco in March 2018, according to a next top Bolsonaro ally. The Chinese spaceship carrying three astronauts had successfully docked with the space station core model Tianhe. And Zambia's former president and independence leader, Kenneth Kaunda, died at the age of 97. From the headquarters of Telesur English in Havana, Cuba, this is From the South. I'm Gladys Quesada. And now we begin with an information because Brazil's President Jair Bolsonaro and former Justice Minister Sergio Moro could be linked to the murder of councilwoman and social activist Marielle Franco in March 2018. Former Rio de Janeiro Governor Wilson Witzel on Wednesday accused the president and former top official of interfering in investigations into Franco's assassination. Witzel, who was impeached for corruption, testified before the Senate Parliamentary Investigation Committee, said that former judge Sergio Moro threatened a key witness who linked President Jair Bolsonaro's family to Ronnie Lessa and Elcio de Queiroz, the killers of Franco and her driver. And now we move on to other Latin American topics. Peru's National Office of Electoral Processes has finally concluded the count of ballots cast in the presidential runoff of June the 6th. But Peruvians continue to await the official announcement of Pedro Castillo as the winner. According to the results published on the Electoral Authority's website, the candidate for the Free Peru Party, who has maintained the lead throughout the count process, secured 50.12% of the vote. Meanwhile, far-right candidate Keiko Fujimori of the Popular Force Party, and who has continued to make claims of fraud, secured 49.87% of the ballots. This represents a difference of just over 44,000 votes between the two candidates in one of the tightest presidential races in Peru's history. As supporters of presidential candidate Pedro Castillo continue to mobilize in the streets, urging the electoral authority to declare the, him the winner, the country's Council of State issued a statement this Wednesday calling for respect for Peru's institutions. The text, signed by interim president Francisco Sagasti, as well as the heads of the legislative and judicial branches, the attorney general, ombudsman, and other top authorities, also reiterates the elections are the only means to come to power in Peru's constitutional democracy while calling for calm and to respect the results. Meanwhile, the National Jury of Elections, the body responsible for delivering the winner of the June 6 presidential runoff, is reviewing the request to annul tens of thousands of ballots submitted by losing candidate Keiko Fujimori. International observers, including from the Organization of American States, have declared the ballot free and with no serious irregularities. On Monday, lawmaker and retired admiral Jorge Montoya, a Fujimori backer, called for new elections to be held, questioning without basis the fairness of the vote alongside 63 other retired generals and admirals. The move prompted Peru's defense ministry to stress the group does not represent the armed forces, as fears of a possible coup spread. Structural failure caused the collapse of a Mexico City metro overpass that left 26 people dead, according to an initial investigation by independent experts published on Wednesday. Norwegian engineering company DMV released a report that identified a number of deficiencies in the construction process linked to the May 3rd disaster. They include problems with the welding, insufficient bolts, and the use of different types of concrete. Dozens were injured when a section of elevated track collapsed and a train came crashing down. The metro line involved in the tragedy has been plagued by problems since it was inaugurated in 2012. The disaster has prompted accusations of negligence and demands for justice from devastated relatives.
And while the Copa America football tournament is taking place, the Brazilian Congress is drafting a series of bills to further develop extractivism in the country, a practice that damages the environment and harms local populations in rural areas. Our team analyzes the measures as well as the risk that the current football tournament represents as a profit-making mechanism in the following report. At the beginning of the pandemic, Brazilian Environment Minister Ricardo Sales recommended to his peers that they take advantage of the media distraction created by COVID-19 to let other things slip by. The pandemic is now joined by a Copa America football tournament that monopolizes TV screens. But 700 indigenous people from 25 villages came from different regions of Brazil to Brasilia, where the atmosphere seems similar to that of an Amerigen cop. On the Congress agenda are a series of bills considered to be the final sentence of the Bolsonaro government against indigenous peoples and the environment. In practice, Law 490 effectively wipes out demarcated indigenous lands by enabling the withdrawal of their territories, forced contact with voluntarily isolated peoples, and permission for the commercial exploitation of their lands. Bill 3729 puts an end to environmental licenses. It is considered the ultimate flexibilization of environmental laws, since it grants the right to self-permits by those who will commit social environmental crimes. Its rapporteur is a rural activist, Cathy Abreu. A series of bills focused on the legalization of grab territories, which will hand over for private use between 60 and 65 million hectares of public lands that were illegally seized by the market. A parliamentary decree that abolishes the main consultation mechanism for indigenous peoples and traditional communities, and finally, a bill presented by Bolsonaro to allow mining, hydroelectric construction, and agribusiness activities on indigenous lands. The measures encourage the current incursions of illegal miners on Yanomami and Munduruku indigenous lands, whose representatives have had problems traveling to Brasilia, precisely because they were surrounded by armed invaders. We have been experiencing invasions of indigenous lands for a long time, mainly on the Yanomami, Kayapo, and our Munduruku related land. We know the environmental crimes and they are perpetrating that the Brazilian authorities uh, don't adopt the necessary measures to punish the people who are harming our mother earth. While governors and majors were busy rejecting the announcement of the Copa America in Brazil, those who agreed to host the event were Rio de Janeiro, Bolsonaro's stronghold, and a city that seeks visibility in order to resume the post-pandemic tourist flow, Brasilia, seat of the government, as well as the capitals of Guayania and Guaivia, the centers of agribusiness. The sector, which is one of the cornerstones of Bolsonaro's administration and has been denounced for social environmental crimes, went against economic trends during the pandemic and saw high profits due to a record harvest. However, in Brazil, more than half of the population is unable to get enough to eat adequately. Brazil didn't have a record food harvest, but a record soybean and sugarcane harvest. But people don't live on soybeans. They don't only consume soybeans. And soybeans are not a sufficient ingredient for animal feed. People don't live of sugar, alcohol, or cachaça either. They need many more things, rice, vegetables, potatoes, cassava, meat, eggs, milk, and all this uh, was not stimulated by the erratic, mistaken, and genocidal policy of the Bolsonaro administration. It is stimulated the soybean that replaced these crops. Indigenous peoples camped out in Brasilia, the city hosting the most football games, together with Rio de Janeiro. Ignacio Lemos y Julia Nassif para Telesur. And we'll be right back after this very short break, so don't go away. Welcome back to From the South. The Shenzhou 12 spaceship carrying three astronauts had successfully docked with the space station core model Tianhe on Thursday. 
This is the first rendezvous and docking between Shenzhou spaceship and China's space station since it was sent into orbit on April 29th. The three astronauts are the first to take up residency in the main living model and will carry out experiments, test equipment, conduct maintenance and prepare the station for receiving two laboratory models next year. Shenzhou 12 is the third of 11 missions, four of which will be crewed, needed to complete China's first space station. The mission will help test technologies related to long-term astronaut states and healthcare, the recycling and the life support system, the supply of space materials, extra vehicular activities and operations, and in-orbit maintenance. China has always stated that outer space is a common treasure of humanity, and that its exploration, development, and peaceful use are the common pursuits of all people around the world. Brazil's Senate this Wednesday put off a vote on the privatization of the state-owned Electrobras Electrical Energy Company in the face of a 72-hour strike action called by its workers and widespread criticism of the move. Our correspondent Brian Mir has the details. On the day of a much-anticipated vote in the Brazilian Senate on the privatization of Electrobras, the state energy company which provides about 37% of the nation's electricity and also has operations abroad, was put off today after pressure from the left opposition and the Union of Electrical Company Workers, which went on a 72-hour strike on the eve of the vote. This has been interpreted as a sign of weakness of far-right President Jair Bolsonaro's ruling coalition. The Senate is controlled by his so-called allies, but even among his allies, there's more and more criticism of this move, which would end up turning a large part of Brazil's patrimony, including many of its hydroelectric dams, over to foreign private capital. Now, it's worth remembering that the massive blackouts that crippled the, the capital of Amapá State, Macapá, was caused by privatization of the municipal electric company. Anyone who's been following the history of energy in Brazil knows that privatizations have always led to disasters, has always led to worse service, has always led to blackouts in this country. So with that being said, it looks like there was a tentative small victory for the Brazilian labor movement today. And in this climate of growing fascism, any victory counts, any victory is important. And this also comes on the eve of massive national anti-Bolsonaro protests scheduled for this Saturday. The first face-to-face -face meeting between the presidents of Russia and the United States ended in Geneva with an agreement to start negotiations on nuclear arms and cybersecurity. Both heads of state described the meeting as positive, so much so that the respective ambassadors will return to their duties in Washington and Moscow. The summit lasted some five hours, putting stress at a press conference afterwards that both nuclear superpowers understand their responsibility in maintaining strategic stability and will negotiate a renewal of the SALT Treaty to keep strategic atomic weapons under control. He said special emphasis was put on curbing cyber attacks, especially the use of ransomware, to hold state, public services and companies hostage. On Ukraine, another contentious issue, both countries agreed that a solution to the conflict in the Donbas area must be based on the Minsk Agreement of 2015, which includes the interests of the Russian-speaking self People's Republic. Points our assessment differ, but from my point of view, both sides show a desire to understand each other and look for ways to converge positions. The conversation was absolutely constructive. I tell you, the tone of the entire meetings, I guess it was a total of four hours, was, 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 was good, positive. There wasn't any, any uh, strident action taken. And around 1,000 demonstrators gathered in Hungary's capital on Wednesday, urging President Janos Adair to strike down a new law that human rights groups say stigmatizes LGBTQ people and limits their rights. The demonstration took place outside Adair's official residence and came a day after Hungary's parliament approved controversial legislation, which was supposedly aimed at fighting pedophilia, but included amendments that prohibit the display or promotion of homosexuality or gender reassignment to minors. In practice, the new law prohibits the portrayal of homosexuality in school sex education programs, films, advertisements, and other media materials aimed at under 18s.
and we have more stories coming up after this final short break, so stay with us. Welcome back. Zambia's former president, Kene Kaunda, the father of independence, has died at the age of 97. He was the last survivor of a generation of leaders in the struggle against European colonialism. He ruled Zambia for 27 years on a socialist one-party state platform, but as it happened with other newly independent states, colonial powers kept their grip on their economies and culture. Widespread corruption and mismanagement ended Kaunda's political career in the country's first plural elections in 1991. A champion of nationalism, African socialism, Kaunda also implemented policies imposed by the International Monetary Fund and was friendly to the United States. Under his rule, Kaunda actively helped the armed liberation struggle of neighboring Rhodesia, Zimbabwe, and South Africa. He was also active in the movement of non-aligned countries. Kaunda had been admitted to the Maina Soko Medical Center, a military hospital in Lusaka, on Monday, where authorities disclosed he was being treated for pneumonia. At least one person died and seven others were missing after houses and bridges were washed away when a river burst during heavy monsoon rains in Nepal. According to official reports, on Wednesday, a landslide caused by the monsoon deluge blocked a river, which then burst and sent a flood of water downstream late Thursday, inundating a settlement near the capital Kathmandu. Rescuers from the police and army rescued at least 60 people, using helicopters for difficult-to-reach areas. The number of deadly floods and landslides had increased in recent years in Nepal. Experts said climate change and more road construction could be triggering the deadly disasters. The river started swelling. Then I heard that a landslide had blocked the river and it was now coming our way, so we all went higher up. The river kept getting big. The situation became frightening. None of the residents have slept tonight. We haven't slept at all looking at this terrifying situation. It all happened after 8 or 9 at night. This area was all flooded. And the elections in Iran are on the final stretch, with five reformers and so-called principalist candidates disputing the ballots. International mainstream media have been depicted a country in mercy in apathy and also discontent after years of economic and financial sanctions by the United States and its allies. The supreme leader of the country, Ayatollah Ali Khamenei, said a high turnout will show the world the strength of the Islamic Republic. With some 57% of support in opinion polls, principally candidate Ibrahim Raisi, the country's judiciary chief, looks poised to emerge as Iran's new president. Speaking of our upcoming elections on Friday, it's been several months that American and British media and the mercenaries working under their flags and those media are killing themselves to maybe question the elections and weaken the participation of the people. They want to somehow make accusations against the elections in the Islamic Republic with all sorts of comments and remarks. If we want the pressure by the enemies, including economic pressures such as sanctions and so on, to be removed or erased, the participation of the people should increase and our public support is shown to the enemies. A general strike in Lebanon is demanding a rescue movement to face the country's acute economic crisis. The strike was called by the Lebanese Labor Union and has been supported by the private sector, traders and banks. This is how Beirut was looking like on Thursday. The strike emptied the streets of Lebanon's major urban centers. Strikers also installed roadblocks. Lebanon is experiencing of its worst economic crisis ever, with shortages of fuel, electricity, medicine, and growing inflation. The Lebanese pound melted down, sliding from 1,500 to the dollar to a street rate around 15,000 in June this year. The currency collapsed when the international financial system withheld funds in punishment for not implementing neoliberal reforms. Later, banks locked out dollar deposits. The blast at Beirut's port that killed some 700 people and wounded 4,000 in 2019 ignited social upheavals and brought down the government. Since then, there has been a provisional government in charge of affairs.
Paraguay goes through its worst moment since the first COVID-19 case was registered in the country. The country ranks as the region with the highest mortality in the world, with a rate of 24.79 deaths per 100,000 inhabitants, according to the count based on official figures. As a result, hospitals are overwhelmed. More than 750 beds of intensive care in their country are occupied. It is estimated that 200 patients are in delicate condition. We came to the aid attended there, but they did not give us any attention. They just urged that there was no space at the time because they were saturated. That was they told us. And we have come to the end of this news brief. But remember, you can find this and many other stories on our website, telesurienglish.net. And also, if you feel so inclined, please join us on social media. We are on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and Telegram. For Telesur English, I'm Gladys Quesada. Thank you for watching.